What's up everybody? This is the Quarantine Man here, and today, during this period of isolation, I've got a special treat for you. Ladies and gentlemen, Marty O'Donnell is on the line. Yes, the legendary composer from Bungie. Hello, Act Man. How you doing? Oh, not bad. You know, it's it's certainly looking up with all this quarantine, getting to talk to you. Well, that's good. I'm I'm glad to hear about that. I, uh, I I'm a little bit bored here myself, although I do have work to do, and we are sort of the studio staying together online. But uh, uh, this is a nice diversion. Thanks for uh, doing this. Oh, you got it, my man. I just got to say, you know, I don't often get to like fanboy over over meeting people <laughs> you know sometimes i'm like on the receiving end of that you know at events and stuff but i know that you are too and so i just want to tell you straight off the bat just how much like the halo soundtracks mean to me and how much i really enjoy them and just the games overall and and really appreciate your work in the industry as a whole well, I appreciate that. You know, it's funny. I, there was a point where, believe it or not, I'm not going to, well, maybe I will drop a bunch of names. But anyway, uh, Bill, <laughs> Bill Gates was actually at uh, a launch party. He was at the launch party for Halo 3. And uh, I was sort of showing him around because it was my job to meet him at the door and show him around the studio and, and introduce him to everybody. And the, and the place was packed. We had everybody who worked on the game, plus all the significant others and family and friends and just tons of people. And they, they just sort of kept coming up to him and everybody was fanboying with Bill. And at one point I, I took him aside and I said, look, you know, I'm really sorry. He's like, you know, this is this is probably too much. Um, you know, I can I can tell people to back off. And he goes, he says, are you kidding? I usually spend all my time with programmers. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I spend my time with guys who don't necessarily fanboy about me at all. So this is fine. Right. I got a big question for you right off the bat. You know, we're doing this this interview, and I wanted to to start hard and fast. All right. Okay. I don't I don't have COVID nineteen. Just so you know. All right. All right. <laughs> Confirmed. All right. Will the Master Chief have COVID nineteen in Halo Infinite? <laughs> Fan theories are still speculating. Yes. But uh, a lot of a lot of Halo fans out there, myself included. I've always like speculated and wanted to know if you've ever considered returning to work on Halo soundtrack as either like a collaborator with 343 or the main composer. Maybe you'd bring back uh, Michael Salvatore as well, team up together. Uh, it certainly has crossed my mind. I, I still love Halo. I love the Halo music. I love what could happen in the future. Um, I think I've sort of said this before, but it the subject other than just something I've thought about basically has never come up. So it's uh, basically, you know, nobody's asked me. So mm. I can consider it all I want, but it uh, doesn't seem to doesn't seem to make any difference. So that's right. how that goes. That was kind of a, a follow up was like, have you ever gotten an offer or email from 343 um, or considered reaching out? I mean, I don't know how things work uh, on that side of the the business if you have to be like reached out to or you know if you could reach out and say hey I'm interested well let me just say this I have I still have friends over at 343 uh, I know a lot of the people over there I'm I'm friends with Bonnie and uh, Kiki and Frank and Brian I have spoken to them casually about it and uh, that's as far as it's gone and so I have I, I would say I've reached out uh, in a casual way, uh, basically just to say, you know, uh, I'd be interested in anything you guys are interested in, whatever that might be, p you know, potentially. But I just don't think that's in the cards. Yeah, it's unfortunate. But hey, you never know. <laughs> let's uh, let's all make a big ruckus. Let's uh, hashtag <laughs> bring back Marty and then let's get that trending or something. Well, I mean, I, I think <laughs> as far as I can tell in terms of the schedule and, and the, the work I'm doing on my own with my own studio Highwire um, I, I kind of think that ship has sailed so um, ah. th that's not going to happen yeah or at least not anytime in the near future right we'll, we'll always right. cling on to hope and just kind of like maybe it'll happen there you go <laughs> I had a, a 
kind of a follow-up question. Is there a game series in particular that you would love to work on? Huh, that's interesting. Yeah, you know, I, I would have loved to have gotten my hands on a couple of products, of uh, uh, titles. The, the team that did... Uh, Shadow of the Colossus and uh, Eco, especially. I just when I when I played Eco way back, I, I just loved what their aesthetic was, and I, I would have loved to have worked on that. But the you know the guy who did the music for them did a spectacularly good job, so I have no complaints there. But that was <laughs> I, I just like their the way they approached games. And the other one is is my friend Austin Wintry, who I I just had a conversation with. Uh, he did Journey, and before that he did Flow, and then he's done a bunch of other things. But that I I just love some of the thoughts that they had on that game. So, you know, as a contrast to the Halo and Destiny big time kind of thing, uh, right. those were smaller, thoughtful titles that I uh, really appreciated their approach. Okay. And of course, you know, I would, I'd love to work on Zelda. <laughs> you know, I had that thought in my head when I was like asking that question. I was about to list an example. My first one was like Zelda. <laughs> Well, well I love Zelda. I played all the Zeldas. I, I almost, like, it was sort of like when I worked on Riven, which was the sequel to Myst. I enjoyed Myst so much, actually playing Myst, that when I got to do, but the first game I ever got to work on was Riven, which was the sequel to Myst. And I was actually just a little bit depressed because I knew I would never be able to play Riven as if I'd never seen it before. Cause, mm. and, and that's how much I enjoyed that uh, kind of game. And actually, you know, thinking of it that way, too, it would have been interesting to have played Halo and had no idea what Halo was. If I would love to just have approached Halo and seen it for the first time along with everybody else. And oh, I, yeah. It would be interesting to see how I would react. It's Watching some of your videos on that, because it's been so long, it actually makes me feel like, oh, yeah, you know, I think I might have... Uh, I'd forgotten some of the details of it, which is you're, yeah, you and other people are actually <laughs> making me go back into my archives looking for stuff because you've sort of inspired me again to think about, you know, oh. the process of making the Halo series. So that's been oh, fun. I appreciate that. And, you know, I have like so many questions to ask. But um, I wanted to ask you about your YouTube channel because you have been yeah. uh, posting there and like some more behind the scenes stuff. As well as yep. like a, a couple jokey videos. I, I really thought your uh, uh, deserted drive to Seattle was, <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, that was a little, you know, the only reason I did that, because I, I actually left uh, Highwire on March 2nd and said, guys, I'm not coming back. I'm like, I'm smack dab in the middle of the, you know, the danger of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, demographic. So I'll see you guys in a few months. So I wasn't making light of it when I did that drive th into Seattle. What happened was I started hearing on the news that Seattle was a ghost town and it was deserted and all this stuff. So I just got into the car and I, and I you know, I drove down into Seattle and drove back. And I'm like, yeah, it's really not that <laughs> deserted yet. Yeah. So that's why I did that. And yeah. I, I just put, a, you know, the sound of wind behind it the whole way to make it seem creepier yeah, and i, I, I don't know i don't think funny. that many people got the joke i'm glad you got the joke <laughs> well i also live in the area so you know i've been yeah <laughs> i haven't been down to seattle in a bit but um yeah i got it but you posted a lot of like uh behind the scenes music sessions like with steve mm -hmm. Vai and you know some unreleased or uh maybe like alpha tracks for some of the halo games why should people subscribe to the marty o'donnell <laughs> channel Oh, well, basically, the main reason I want people to subscribe is because I can't understand how guys like you have like a blue check mark or whatever you are. You're your check. You have a check because you got over 100,000 people. Yep. So it's like people don't believe it's actually me. So I figure if everybody just subscribes, then I'll get the check and I don't have to worry anymore. Uh, yeah. I'm not I'm not charging. I'm not doing advertising. I, I'm not trying to make money at it. And I I'll leave that to you. You guys. Uh, I just like having a channel that when I feel so inspired to share something that I find in my archives, I can throw it up there and, and see what people think. Obviously, people can just go and, and watch things. They don't have to subscribe. I want them to subscribe so I can get the little check. Yeah. I got a check on my Twitter account, but I don't have a check on my YouTube account. 
Yeah, we'll we'll push you up there. You know, you keep uploading, okay. and uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll yeah. Actually, that's the problem. It's like it, I have to work too hard on content, and I'm never going to do that. So right, it's going to be f probably few and far between. But I mean, you know, every little bit counts. You know, even stuff that maybe you've never talked about before. You know, people are always interested in like the development of old games, whether it's Halo or or you know mm -hmm. even um, Oni. Or just like old titles like people are always into that so even if you just like set up a camera and just start talking about what it was like you know doing this or that you know you never know how how far simple stuff like that can take you to add on to that I wanted to ask about like the old Bungie Vidox and sort of the way you guys filmed your journey like starting with Halo 2 I don't think there were many like combat evolved Vidox, but um right there were none basically yeah i felt like those were pretty unique in the world of gaming because there weren't a whole lot of companies doing that sort of thing and like putting in those edited videos into you know collector's editions and whatnot and, and i felt like as a young kid or like a teenager watching those it's like i really got connected to this company bungee and like the individuals inside of it and got to know them and I feel like there wasn't a whole lot of that with other video game companies and I was kind of curious like what was the reasoning behind creating those videos well it's funny I've gone back into my own video archives and that's I think I have a video that's up on my site that starts in early 2001 uh, like January 2001 when we first moved into um, Redmond and of course, it's just me with a you know a little handheld video camera, and it's very informal and funny and stupid. And <laughs> what do you think, Jason? Do you? Woo okay. <laughs> I shared that, but that's as much as we were doing at the time. It was like we we were none of us at Bungie were thinking about uh, marketing or promotional use of these kinds of behind the scenes things. Right. But what happened was there was a guy in. Um, Los Angeles named Jim McQuillan, if you might have heard of his name. But Jim uh, had a company down there and he did work for the Discovery Channel and they were doing a documentary on the Xbox and he got really interested in, at the time, the most successful launch title for the Xbox, mm -hmm. which was Halo. So he figured out how to sort of start filming us after we shipped Halo. Oh. And uh, there was a, some interviews with some of the Halo guys Anyway, he got really interested in, in how we made Halo. He, he was super interested in that. And then he made a deal with us to, he, I think it might have even been his idea, I'm not sure, but he wanted to document the, the work on Halo 2. And then that turned into all the extra stuff that came on Halo 2's um, extra bonus disc and, oh, yeah. and the behind the scenes Vidox. And he, he just started doing everything. And that, you know, he's, he invented the term Vidox. <laughs> right. Um, at that point, I stopped bringing in my, you know, home video camera. The only thing I did was I, sh I had Jay Wineland, my audio director, or audio lead, mm. actually. Um, he filmed the Steve Vai session. And we had a new camera that we had gotten and he sort of, we didn't know how to work it, so it's kind of dark and grainy and funny. Yeah. Uh, and so I just kept it to myself, I, that little session Hell video, yeah. until last year. And that's when I shared it with everybody else. And I thought, I really honestly thought maybe a couple hundred people would be interested in seeing this sort of long, grainy, dark, you know, behind the scenes thing. Because I got so used to the high quality um, Vidox that, that Jim McQuillan was making, I was really embarrassed by how cruddy the stuff that I did was looking but I, I kind of forget that people but then you did the music you know so did he do music that was as yeah. good as yours I don't know no I don't think so <laughs> no as a matter of fact he, he used my music a lot so that's that was always the the struggle with me and Jim was always like he was always looking for more music Marty give me some more music so I can do these score you know score these videos and I'm like Jim, I gotta use this music in the game. I can't just let you have it all the time. So right, and we had a good time. I I, I love Jim. He's he's a great guy. He he worked on. He came up and started working full time for Bungie uh, during the Halo Three time period, and then kept all the way through Destiny and Destiny Two. And I think he's independent again now. Oh, gotcha. 
But you're right. Uh, very few people were doing the kind of in-depth stuff. And, and the reason for that, and I'm glad he did it, was because we didn't want to just be a nameless, faceless studio that was part of Microsoft. We, we had our own personality. We had people inside the studio that had personalities. Uh, and I think people who appreciate the games appreciate knowing who the creative people are behind the game. And so he, he did a real service to, to me and a whole bunch of other guys over at Bungie and uh, made us look good. Oh, you know, and that's that's the whole thing. Like, it's just, it's one thing to be like, you know, I'm, I'm a super big fan of, uh, I don't know, Paper Mario, The Thousand Year Door, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, or Banjo-Tooie, or, you know, those are just some of my favorite games off the top of my head. But none of those have, like, those type of video documentaries, and it, and it really just builds, like, a sort of uh, identity. And, and, you know, now I get to connect with, you know, people like Marty O'Donnell or Joe Staten. Is it Staten or Staten? It's Staten. Staten, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it's, I think it's spelled like Staten, like Staten Island, but he always yeah. says Staten. So, but even Ed Freeze calls him Staten. So he, a okay. lot of people get that wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's yeah. Staten, unless he's never corrected me. <laughs> What's it like working with Marty? That's a good question. Joe? Oh, well, I mean, it's the best. Working with Marty is an effort in patience and restraint He's hilarious, he's funny, he's sharp. He gets to bitch like nobody's business about how much work he has and how little time there is. Or Jason Jones or all those guys. I just yeah. wanted to bring that up because it was such a big part of like Bungie's identity to me and sort of that next level, uh, exactly what you said, like not just being a, a faceless, nameless brand sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you know, I, I think, in the film business, you know, you, you know who George Lucas is, you know who Steven Spielberg are, uh, you know, you know who all the actors are, you mm -hmm. know who the people behind this, you know, these, some of these big blockbuster uh, films are. Uh, it, that just has not been the habit in the game business. Everybody's sort of anonymous. Exactly. And, and I, I think that's a shame because I don't think, this is my opinion, of course, but I just don't think we're all interchangeable. I think things change when you change the people. That's why my motto is always be nice to the goose is because I think the goose that lays the golden egg, it's not the, the egg that you need to care about, it's the goose. And the goose is the team. And the, the team that made you know the Halo games uh, was a pretty unique team. And the, some of those people are not interchangeable and, and you know, you take some of those people out of the mix and, and I think the games change. Yeah, you know, you can just like see all the passion. Like one of the things that really sticks out to me is just like Joe's passion for the story and, and just like how invested he is in it, uh, especially with like Halo 2, you know. And so that really oh, yeah. jumps out at you. And then now I associate the stories with him and, you know, it wouldn't be the same if he wasn't a part of that documentary or anyone else for that matter. Right. A, a couple of us um, probably got more FaceTime than we should have because there were a lot <laughs> of people on the team that did spectacular work. But Joe and myself and even Jason Jones up to a, a little bit. He was always good on camera, but he hated being on camera. <laughs> Joe and uh, you know, Joe and I never had trouble being on camera. Um, so we, we probably got more airtime than we deserved. But um, that's just the way it is. You know how it is. If, if, oh, yeah. You know, I know how it is. If, if, if you're sort of fun to watch, then you end up getting filmed a bunch. So, Exactly. And, and of course, it was. I, I love the behind-the-scenes stuff. Uh, I'm so glad that Jim had professional videographers at some of the voice sessions with some of the actors that I was able to cast and hire and work with. Kill me or release me, Parasite. But do not waste my time with talk. It's amazing to me how many amazing actors we had, and I, my memory of some of those sessions is starting to recede. And then I watch the videos, and I'm like, oh yeah, that was a, that was a great session. Nathan Fillion and Keith David and Ron Perlman and uh, everybody. It was just great. Katie Sackhoff. I mean, come on, I got to work with Katie Sackhoff. That was a blast. Yeah, everyone in there, even through you know ODST, and that was actually oh, yeah. one of my uh, one of my questions I had written is. Like, who are some of the most um, incredible and extraordinary people that you have worked with uh, behind the scenes? I mean, you kind of listed some, but... Uh... Well, yeah. 
uh, in terms of the actors, you know, I also like Alan Tudyk and Adam Baldwin and Trisha Helfer was great. I love the cast in ODST. It was so much fun. But of course, musicians like, you know, Steve Vai, of course, was a once in a lifetime experience for me. And, and then, of course, come on, Sir Paul McCartney. Like, yeah. how is that even a thing? How can how I? How was that a thing? Know, Holy um, crap. Yeah. <laughs> that was a thing. What can I say? I sometimes wonder if that even actually happened. But, you know, I still have his, I still got his sessions with me here at my, on my computer. I still have a ton, believe it or not, I have a ton of video that I've never shared mm. of me and of me and Paul. At some oh, point when the statute of limitations, now. whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to go back into that and... Oh, yeah, I was going to ask uh, legal obligations and that sort of thing with those videos. You know, I really don't care about legal obligations. I mean, I've been through the mill on with lawyers and legal stuff. I, you know, yeah. I'm just, I don't care. Like, to me, it's sort of like, look, come after me. But I, you know, I haven't talked to Paul about sharing that stuff. And I think I would rather, you know, get his okay on it. Uh, if he said okay, then I would just I would share it. I just okay. haven't talked to him about it. All right, let's let's all let's all spam Paul McCartney on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I loved working with him. That was over a two year period, and we we worked together in several different studios, and it was a it was really a, an amazing experience. That's just insane. I also uh, had a friend wanted to ask a question. He's also a YouTuber, Chris Raygun, and it kind of ties into this. Uh, you know, behind the scenes music and everything. He wants to know, yeah. uh, what did you think of having contemporary bands like Breaking Benjamin and Incubus involved with Halo 2's soundtrack? Was it a highly collaborative environment or was it more of a remote integration process? Uh, you know, I got to meet everybody who worked on Halo 2. I It wasn't really super collaborative. Um, mm. Incubus, for example, was, they, they had a, a portable Halo, multiple Halo box system or Xbox system that they toured with. And they were <laughs> huge Halo fans. And I think they came to Nile Rogers, who was the producer in New York, who, and he said, yeah, why don't you guys do some stuff and I'll, you know, send it to Marty. And then Nile was, he called me up and said that they were performing at the Key Arena and so I went down there while they were rehearsing. And when I walked in, they were rehearsing and I was listening to what they were doing. And then somebody told them that I was standing out there <laughs> and they all stopped what they were doing. And they're like, oh, gosh, it's Marty. You know, we want to talk to you about Halo. We love your music. So that was just really fun. And so they wrote, you know, some stuff. And it, that was not very collaborative, but I was able to take their stems and I'm like, I'll I'll take what you've given me. I think it, the song that I used inside the game was uh, "Follow." I think it was called. Yeah. And and uh, it actually has more lyrics to it, more singing in in the original version. Um, but I was able to take the stems and then cut them up and make it adaptive and and have it fit into that one area. And then Breaking Benjamin, uh, Benjamin, oh, I forget his name, Benjamin, whatever his, his name is, Benjamin something. Yeah. Uh, but he wanted to do a, a song, and so he did Blow Me Away, and I got to hear that. And he came into the studio and showed me what he was doing. And I'm like, yeah, I, I said, if you give me the stems, you know, you can release the song with the singing on it, and I'll use the instrumental part, oh, and I'll figure out a place awesome. to put it. I almost wished... Um that that song had played more throughout Halo 2 because I think it plays only in uh, like one section yeah, just one spot oh, yeah but it's that memorable. was back when yeah that was back when you know it, it just I, I felt like everything I had to have lots of music for like and it always had to you know I never wanted it to repeat I might repeat one piece that was in level one and it would come back in level five or something mm-hmm but I rarely did anything more than twice. And I was a little nervous about the style change from what people were expecting the Halo music to be to Incubus and Breaking Benjamin and even the Steve Vai stuff. I was getting some pushback inside Bungie. Really? Uh, some of the, oh yeah, some of the artists were like, this this is horrible, you shouldn't be doing this. Whoa, this is the whoa, wrong time feeling. out. Time out. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what it's like when you have to work with a bunch of other guys. You have to like collaborate and hear yeah. what they, you know, they complained about everything. 
Marty, what's all that guitar wanking stuff? You gotta stop that. That doesn't has no place in Halo. So I had to sort of put my foot down and say, you know, trust me on this. I think I think this could work. And just look just at give how me it turned out. Yeah, there you go. I'm sure some of those guys still don't like it. <laughs> well, they have to now. <laughs> There's even a decent amount of guitar in Combat Evolved, you know. Maybe not so yeah, uh, yeah. blaring, but there was, you know, like a couple uh, pieces where it it was really like, okay, that's pretty freaking awesome. And then it, it's almost like the Steve Vai guitar is is like an evolution. Um, oh, what is that? It's not gun pointed at the head of the world. No, it's rock band, rock. rocks, uh, rock anthem for saving the universe. That's right. Yeah, and rock anthem for saving the world. Yeah, is that what it's called? I think so. I can't remember. Saving the universe, whatever. Yeah, that was my that was my guitar player from uh, from Chicago, Harry Mura, who he played on every Halo that I did, except for Halo Two, because we got suddenly we got all these other guitar players that came flowing in wanting to play. So I didn't hire Harry again for Halo 2, but then he came back for Halo 3, he came back for ODST, he did just some beautiful stuff on ODST, and he played on Reach and did some great stuff on that. So yeah, I've had you know nice electric guitar on every single Halo that music track that ever was done by Bungie at least. Yeah man, those soundtracks are just incredible. And a lot of times I would just kind of like listen to them as I was in college and like working and you know, just like, I never thought I would actually like get to meet you in person, which we did at PAX, or even like talk to you, yeah, or yeah. even conduct an interview that I would later post on my channel. You know, <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you know, you guys apparently all grew up with this stuff. I just got older. That's all that happened for me. So I'm glad to be able to talk to you. Yeah, I met you at uh, PAX, and uh, I, I don't think. And by the way, I, I'm sure there's going to be some people who are like, why are you talking to the act man? He's, he's only one of many people that do Halo content. And uh, I haven't followed everybody else. I don't, know, I don't know the community that well in terms of people who are doing things. Um, I, I met that other guy, the British guy, <laughs> who I like. Hidden experience? What's his name? Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, he's a great dude. I like his stuff. He he's he's he was fun. I've watched some of his things. Um, but I think it's because I met you and then I watched. I think the first thing I watched was something you did on ODST, and then I saw you had a whole series of why is something so good or why is something so bad. Yeah, that's how you found my channel. Yeah, I don't. I it's it came up with ODST. I think when I was doing something, uh -huh. some retrospect on ODST. Anyway, it came up. So I'm watching it. I'm like, yeah, I think I met this guy. But I, I'll tell you the the main reason I'm intrigued by some of your thoughts is that I I feel like you saw what I've always seen, which was there was something somewhat magical about Halo Combat Evolved, the very first one. Yes. Uh, there and when you when you described it, I'm like, yeah, that's what I think too. It it's certainly yeah, it's more primitive in terms of technology and graphics and blah 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 blah. But there's something magical about that game, the way a lot of different ideas came together and the, and the, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And um, I still, when I look back on all the games, there's still something, I don't know if it's just because it's the first one I worked on or, or if it's something else, but I still think there's something um, unique about Halo Combat Evolved. And I feel like you sort of tapped into that. I listened to some of the th thoughts you had about it and i thought yeah this guy's right so appreciate it man. happy to talk to you yeah I really appreciate that i it i don't very few people in the game business um actually think that there'll be fans out there that study what we do to the depth that guys like you do so when we see fans who seem to appreciate some of these details that we never thought anybody was going to pay attention to it's actually really encouraging and it's, it's a little daunting because that means, yeah, whatever I do next or whatever any of us do next, there's going to be people out there that really take it apart. Yeah. But that's exciting. Yeah. And I kind of, I really appreciate that because, you know, I would replay some of those campaigns, you know, just notice all these little details here and there. And in fact, one thing I kind of touched on in my Halo 3 review, um, if you ever watched that one, I think that one might be. I did. I did. Did you like the intro? Yeah, that was excellent. I mean, I you you know a lot of people just think yeah because 
te technically we got better and better on each game, that doesn't necessarily mean that we, you know, connected all the dots as mm. well. Uh, and if you if you're able to understand that there was some technical limitations, that of course it didn't seem like there was at the time when we were doing Halo Combat Evolved, but somehow uh, with the constraints we had and then the, you know, we we somehow did connect a lot of dots for Halo Combat Evolved that I sometimes feel like we walk, we got away from on some of the other things. And I know you're, and it's a sort of a joke amongst all of us, but I know you're one of the ones who likes to complain about jackal snipers oh, every yes. chance you get. But. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually that's actually one of those things where even at the time I was like, guys, you, we're violating one of our fundamental precepts. You never have, you never you're never supposed to get killed without giving the player a chance. Yes, thank you. It's 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 ridiculous that you can get killed just walking around a corner an instant and instant death, and then you have to say, okay, now I have to figure out when I respawn where that guy is and. It's just like that's horrible game design, and we knew it. I think it was uh, just something we ended up shipping anyway. Yeah, having to do for <laughs> one reason or, or another. But you know, Halo Two and Three still, despite whatever troubles and the sniper jackals, they're still incredible, fantastic games. One thing I noticed in my time, kind of replaying the games and listening to the soundtracks, is you guys were able to remix old songs say uh, you know a walk in the woods from combat evolved that mm -hmm. was remixed for halo 2 3 and reach and there's a yep. part in my video where like with a little bit of editing you know you can seamlessly uh transition one piece into the next on, on like the same beat and it, you know but it's different yep. and i just thought that was so cool but i also wanted to know like what was the thought process behind that? Was it one of those like <laughs> details or, or things that you wanted maybe subconscious familiarity with the older games in the new or? Yeah, so that's that's called desperation. <laughs> <laughs> so is it? Uh, yes, it's it's uh, you know I especially I was alone at the beginning of of working on Halo One for the most part. I had left Mike Salvatore back in Chicago. And then I would I would make a bunch of stuff that was just just some ideas and some beginnings of stuff and snippets of tunes and songs, and I would send him a big pile of stuff in Chicago and I say, Mike, do something with this. And then if you come up with anything, you come up, you make some stuff and send it to me, and I'll start working with it. You know, for example, Walk in the Woods is primarily Mike's tune. He would send it to me, and then I do something to it, add a little something to it, or gotcha. sing over it, or whatever. I would do Under Cover of Darkness, and I would be thinking, well, this would be the kind of thing Mike might do, and then I would send it to him. And so these things went back and forth. But anyway, when we, we knew that we were still working on Halo, so it's like everything we did on Halo 1 was fair game to be rearranged and used in a new way, repurposed, rearranged, um, extended remade uh, elaborated on remade so it was no reason there was no reason why we should couldn't take any theme that we had uh and build on it and so there are tunes like that like i i forget as i'm going back through some of my early stuff i was i've been looking at some of my early halo stuff and i realized wow this piece then i sort of redid this way and then i took that melody and redid a new thing over here you know like for P perilous journey ends up being in Halo 2, I thought I'm going to do something like Perilous Journey, but I'll call I'll start peril. and make it go a different way and call it Peril. <laughs> That's why the, the names are the same, basically. So uh, that, we did that with Walk in the Woods. We did that with just about every theme you can think of, um, because we just needed so much content, and we knew that that would be uh, it would be sort of a friendly, comfortable place. Yeah. For people who were fans of Halo, they'd start playing Halo 2, and they'd hear a lot of new things. But then they'd hear something somewhat familiar. It's almost kind of like Combat Evolved was as popular and as revolutionary as it was for a reason. And so, like having those familiar beats from that game, like and, and hearing those again, yeah. you know, it just kind of like, is like, you know, I'm experiencing the next iteration of this, and it really feels like it. it feels like it's made by the same people, and they've got the same goals in mind. And, and the music just has such a big part of that. Well, it's it, what's funny to me is how easy 
it is to do it that way because why should you walk away from a theme or a melody or a feel or something that you know is already successful? It, it has what I like to call emotional equity. That's and a great term. It's, it's like, okay, I need another action piece. Well, I'm going to make an action piece based on some other piece that people already have emotional equity with, and that'll make it seem like it's all of a whole. And I play a lot of games, and this is one of the great things about Zelda and, and some of the other Nintendo games, is that they do bring back melodies that you are familiar yep. with. Final Fantasy, all of those, you know, those composers understand the, the power of melody and theme and feel and all these other things that you bring it back do it again um why not? just to do something just to do something new all the time uh it, it's sort of you start to lose connection with the audience with your fans uh, the players so yeah that's why i do that i think it's i think it's a it's much easier to do which is why starting on destiny was such a like pain because suddenly it's like oh this is a whole new universe i can't I can't rely on any of those melodies, right. or I, I, I have to throw everything out and start over. Yeah, and kind of. And that's why the music whole... of the spheres started. Yeah. Which is actually interesting because um, I do have a couple questions from my patrons, and one of the things some of them were interested in is, what do you think about the soundtracks for Halo games that you weren't involved with? Have you ever checked them out, listened to them, and uh, what are your thoughts? Yes. So thoughts on stuff I didn't work on that I could get myself into trouble for, for anything. Um, oh, gosh, I was going to say Kojima. Goodness sakes. Kazuma. Um, um, and then uh, Neil Davidge uh, are spectacular. And I thought they did some just beautiful music for Halo 4. And then Kazuma did some great stuff for Halo 5. And I... I I didn't spend time playing the games, so I can't really judge on how the emotional mm. impact of the music is was integrated. in the games because I, I just didn't play it. Yeah, but I mean, they're they're wonderful composers. They're really good. I I would say that I think to some degree they fell into the trap that some of these big companies get into where. There are too many other voices mm. in the mix, meaning there's too many other creative people that are poking at people's creativity. I was able to, you know, fend that off as much as possible. If, you know, people said, Marty, what's with that piano in Halo 3? Why is that dang, gang, 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 gang? That's stupid. I could say, Oh my. Yeah, no, no, Time it really out. happened. Time out again. <laughs> <laughs> Hold up. Uh, Believe it or not, the, the marketing people at Microsoft actually laughed when they heard it. So what? I had to, yeah, no. Did, haven't you heard that story? I swear I've told that before. No, I I have not heard that before, but that Yeah. Well now the problem is of course that wow. like I get more and more stubborn. I start to believe in my own, you know, I start to believe my own press. I start to believe that my instincts are, you know, flawless, which is not true. But um I, I didn't have to listen to too many voices coming out of Bungie or Microsoft because I think everybody was just too busy and, and they just trusted me to do what I did. And I was able to, you know, lead up a team like, you know, with Mike and then later on with, with C. Paul Johnson and Stan Lepard and other guys who helped write stuff with me. And I could just say, here's a bunch of themes, have fun with it. I'll decide later on how I want to use it or if I want to add to it. And it was all up to me because I'm the audio director. So if, you know, Marcus, the art director, came to me and said, you know, I don't like something, I would say, well, yeah, so what? You're the art director. I'm the audio director. So that's not always the way it happened. He and I would, would talk and, and we collaborated really well. But I never had anybody who was over me saying, you can't do that music or I want you to do something that sounds like you know, holst. Yeah. And it, it, I never had that, but I feel my sense is that after Bungie left Microsoft, there was nobody really over there who I would consider to have the same uh, position within the studio that I had. As audio director, I could, I would take the blame for anything people didn't like about the audio or the music. Right. But I was leading a team that I would want to give credit to for the whole thing. But like, I never had to like just do what the publisher wanted or do what anybody wanted. And luckily, the creative directors on all the Halo games, 
Jason Jones and Paul Breton and and you know even working with Joe Staten or Marcus Leto, um, they never dictated terms to me about music. They would the the most they would do is say this doesn't seem like it's the right feeling. It it makes me feel goofy instead of scared. And I like okay that's more a good... so express like a a concern. Yeah, give me the emotions that you want to feel. Give me the emotions that you think you're not feeling, and I'll take another stab at it. But um, my sense is that uh, I, you know that was pretty unique for me. I got to do that, and a lot of other composers in both the Halo series and other games might not have gotten quite as much freedom. Awesome. There was a, a couple of fans who wanted to know um, what you thought your best work was, either like individual song or um, overall soundtrack, either with the Halo games or Destiny or, or anything else that you've worked on, what would you say? Boy, that's a tough one. Um, you always tend to feel like the latest thing you did, like Echoes of the First Dreamer. I think I've got some really amazing things that are pretty unique on there. But then I'll go back and I'll hear something I did 10 years ago and I'll go, wow, that was really good. I forgot how nice forgot that was. forgot how good so that was. It's really hard for me. Yeah. Uh, and of course, Music of the Spheres, uh, you know, I think is stands alone in a lot of ways. It's There's some really amazing things in there. But like I said, I mean, I, I can go back into the archives and, and pick something out and go, wow, that actually, that is worth listening to. I'm glad I did that. Or I'm glad Mike and I worked on that. Or I'm glad C. Paul and Stan and Mike and I worked on it, or whatever. It's just like, um, sometimes it's just, what's the last thing I heard? And that's my favorite yeah. thing. I kind of swap between, you know, that with my videos to a degree where I'll go back and maybe rewatch one and say, hey, you know, that one might be one of my favorites or if not my favorite. And then, yeah, yeah I kind of get that process. Uh, but uh, I, at the same token, there are things that I thought were great at the time. And then I listened to them and I'm like, Ugh, yeah, fast forward to that. <laughs> That's kind of lame. But I won't tell you what those are. All right. We'll just have to speculate. Yes. Um, I got a couple other viewer questions. I've been kind of getting her losing track of time because it's just, it's, it's such a blast talking to you. So Aaron kind of asked this question about uh, something I feel like we talked about where, um, what was your experience working with Bungie on the first game and how did that compare as the series grew to enormous success? We kind of touched on that a bit, but is there anything you'd want to elaborate on what it was like working on Combat Evolved? Well, the... Combat Evolved was the only game we worked on where the expectations were way right. lower than what ended up happening after that. But the team itself had already worked on Myth, The Fallen Lords, and Myth 2, and Oni. So we, we were already a team that, that knew how to work together. And we had done, you know, like the Macworld Steve Jobs uh, presentation of Halo. So I personally felt like Halo had huge potential but while we were working on it there was a lot of people who didn't believe it, it was going to be all that good and, and we just wanted it to not be embarrassed we wanted to do our best but once it took off that really changed the, the work oh, environment yeah. i wouldn't say it changed drastically but it's like we suddenly knew that like wow this is you know we have to we have to outdo what we already did and there was almost no pressure on us the first time that's not exactly true. There was pressure because, you know, Microsoft bought Bungie specifically to make Halo into right. a launch title for the Xbox. But we weren't the only thing coming out. And it's like it became so much more successful than anybody's expectations were at the time that by the time we started working on Halo 2, it was like, OK, well, now this is getting serious. We got to really uh, I, I just feel like eh, things got a little bit more tense, but not too bad. But that's probably one of the reasons why the, the Halo 2 crunch is legendary, because Pun intended. we just had a lot of pressure on ourselves. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's true. Scott Castle wanted to know, what are some underrated game soundtracks that you would recommend or games? Uh, you talked about Eco and Journey. Are there any underrated game soundtracks that you would recommend? Well, gosh. Well, I mean... <laughs> Ori and the Blind Forest oh. is a beautiful game with an absolutely great soundtrack. But I, I don't. I guess that's not underrated. But I remember when I first heard it, first started playing it, I immediately called uh, called the guy. I emailed the guy. I can't remember his name now. Anyway, I, I emailed him right away and just said, "Hey, 
nice job. That That's just beautiful. It's really well done. And then uh, Jessica, what's her name? Everyone's gone to the Rapture. What is that? Bioshock? Game? No, 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 no. No. <laughs> It's a, it's, it's a British company. Uh, it, it, people like to call it a walking simulator, but it's just got oh, some... Oh, Death Stranding. Oh. No, 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 no. Oh, really? Death Stranding is a walking simulator. <laughs> By the way, I saw your video on that, and, and I didn't want, I don't think I watched the whole thing, but I, that whole bit where you're walking in the, in, the, in the field with a backpack on is hilarious. Yeah, I got to just say that. You like the funny. intro. <laughs> yeah. Everybody, everybody's gone to the rapture. I think... Anyway, someone will in the comments below say what it is, and the I can't remember her last name either. But I've I've talked to her. It's it's got some of the most beautiful music, yeah, I've ever heard in a game. And that is definitely underrated because the game maybe wasn't as big a hit as it could have been, but the the music in that game is amazing. And of course, I'm missing tons of games that I love the soundtracks too. So Maurizio wanted to know what's a stressful day that comes to mind when working on music. Maybe not a hardworking day, but a day that just had a lot going on. Uh, the absolutely worst time, and there were some bad times on just about every game where there's crunch, but I think that the one that I, sticks in my head the most is on Halo 1, because we got down to the wire and there was no pushing this. We, we had to be a launch title. Right. So we hadn't worked out technically how we were gonna do all the cinematics in Halo 1. I hadn't scored music f for any of the cinematics. Jay hadn't done the sound design for the cinematics because the cinematics weren't working yet in engine, so we couldn't capture them and you know, score them and, and do sound design. So they finally started coming in and we had 33 to do. And we on the calendar, we had three days to do all 33. Wow. So I said, Jay, you go into your studio, I'll go into my studio, and we'll see where we are at the end of the day. And on the first day, I got done with 11. And I thought, that's good. I need to get done with 11. There's three days, 33 titles, right? Right. The second day was 9-11-2001. Oh. <laughs> oh, my God. Are you serious? Yeah. And wow. talk about... It's sort of like this you know, coronavirus thing. It just changed everything. Yeah. So up to that point, it was like the most important thing in the world was finishing Halo and making Halo and everything that was Halo, Halo. You had to do these, you know, cinematics. And I woke up, you know, my wife got me up, we got down to the TV, you know, one of my daughters was there. I mean, it, we just watched that. And then I called, at some point I called Jay and he was at the office working. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> So I, li I lived very close. I was about five minutes away. So I went in and sure enough, all the boys were having a, a meeting in the conference room talking about what they needed to get done because of the deadline. And I said, everybody go home. There's, you should be spending this day with your family. Let's mm. all get back t tomorrow. We, we'll, we, won't, we won't let the you know, terrorists win, but this is a day you should spend with your family. Yeah. So I, I turned around and left. And sure enough, we had... We still, I still ended up doing everything in three days. I just got one extra day. Oh, so that, perfect. That was very, very intense. Yeah, super intense. So I can't help but watch the cinematics in Halo and not think about that. <laughs> which also ties into uh, something I had written down, which was I did an interview with Hardy LaBelle back a couple <laughs> years Hardy. on this channel. And um, it does kind of tie into this. said something about... Yes. Okay, yes, go he ahead. Did. I, I won't say what he said. Right. I, I um, wouldn't be surprised if he said something about me. I just wanted to know your side of the story because <laughs> <laughs> for those of you that watched that that interview, great interview uh, by the way. He told this story about how it was either the last day before Combat Evolved went gold and he needed multiplayer sounds and he, he came up to you and was like, Marty, we need multiplayer sounds and then you were just like I'm too busy, and, and he snatched some of your headphones and went and did it himself. That's close to true. I'll give you my side of it. <laughs> okay. I had told him from the beginning, like, Hardy, n none of us are going to have time to, to help you on this. We are so last minute on everything else. If you can't find something we've already done, then you're just going to have to make it yourself. And he goes, that's impossible, that's impossible. I swear that when he came to me and said, I need you to do this, I was like, yeah, talk to the hand. <laughs> yeah. So, 
Uh, I'm pretty sure I said talk to the hand. And then I said, here's some headphones. He didn't snatch them, but I gave oh, him some oh. headphones. And I, I gave him a pile of sound effects libraries. And I said, have fun. See you later. Whatever you do is going to be great. And you know what? He, he, he did, did a it. great job. Yes. Now, remember that the, the sound design for all the levels were done. I, you know, I can't even remember all the stuff. All the weapon sounds and all the movement sounds and all the stuff like that was in, from the campaign anyway. So that was all done. Right. What wasn't done were the unique sounds for multiplayer, like the hill moving. And uh, I didn't even remember all the other sounds that were in there. But there was a whole bunch of stuff that he, I'm just like, yeah, dude, like, have a good time. Go. Yeah. So he likes to, he likes to say that he was multiplayer design lead and multiplayer audio design lead. So. Yeah. He, says he can he was, say that uh, if he wants. Says he was uncredited <laughs> in the credits for those things. <laughs> That's true, because there was, for me, there was just too much other, it would be confusing to think that all the sounds you're hearing in multiplayer were that came out of Hardy's head, but they, it wasn't. It was the unique sounds for multiplayer. But, I mean, we'd already done, uh, you know, um, Jeff Steitzer, who was the, the announcer voice, Kiltacular. Oh. You know, we had done all that stuff, and... Uh, so multiplayer was working pretty well. Uh, we just didn't have some of the unique sounds that, that went for different ways of playing multiplayer. Gotcha. Uh, so he had to come up with those. Yeah. You And then I approved I approved them. So there, that's something, right? Yeah, yeah. You couldn't have done it without <laughs> you. Yeah, that's exactly right. So let us consider this matter ended. <laughs> it's ended, yeah. yes. Yeah. You've got to work with some incredible people and in studios over the years, Marty. And you've really made a name for yourself amongst gamers and, you know, kind of established this, you know, your own personal legacy. My final question is, what do you have left to do? Like, what what does Marty <laughs> O'Donnell still want to do or accomplish when it comes to, you know, video game soundtracks or, or even above and beyond that or, you know, out completely outside of that? That is a great question because... I have never spent much mental energy trying to plan ahead, like what is my next move going to be. It, I, I've been very lucky, other than the fact that like as soon as I played Myst um, in 1993, I played a beta version of it, it, immediately I was thinking the game audio business has gotten to the point where I'd love to jump in and start working in that area. So. Every once in a while, something will catch my attention, and I'll say, "I want to do that. I want to do something like that." So, you know, I did I did movie scores, I did uh, commercials, and radio. I've done a bunch of radio and big games. And uh, I what I like about games is I want to see if we can take the interactive medium to another level of people taking it seriously. So they even have a hard time calling it a game. Uh, it will probably always be called video game because that's you just just can't get away from that. Nah. But I, I would love to work on something, and I think we might be working on something now that that could be um, seen as something that that really takes the industry seriously and uh, is is something that is. I know this sounds very pretentious, but it, it could be more than a game, and I would love to see that happen. I think it's time for the industry to sort of mature. Yeah. So that's what I want to work on. Perfect, Marty. Well, you know, I really appreciate all the time you've given me today. Uh, it, sure. It's been an honor talking to you, and I know all my fans are going to just eat this video up. You know, you guys got to go subscribe to Marty O'Donnell's channel. Let's get him that check mark. I got to get a check. The check mark at the very <laughs> least, all right? <laughs> at the least. Yeah, and, yes. and check out his videos, you know. Got a bunch of great behind the scenes stuff you know and marty's always got hidden archives so there you go i'm gonna get more what what would happen if he do, does a 100k special video oh, it might bring something amazing out of the back gate who knows could happen yeah could happen all right very good act man it was a pleasure pleasure having you on marty all right see you later see everybody that's all we got for today this is the act man and marty signing out peace